Moriah. Mount Moriah with Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Remember that? Okay. Then we have Mount Zion. Nope, I'm sorry. Take that back. We forgot one. Mo. Forgot good old Mo. Sinai. Then we have Zion. And then we have Calvary. The last of the covenants. Okay? And the men whom God made these with? Adam, Noah, Abraham, Abraham Moses, Moses David, David, Jesus, and Jesus. Yes. Okay? I don't like the way that looks. Moses, there we go. Okay? All of salvation history from beginning of eternity past until eternity future has been this covenant relationship. I keep stressing this because it is the key to help unlocking the message of the scriptures. Why, are, why did God give us this book? Is a way to understand the plan that he has. And that this outline is basically the outline to understanding the relationship that God had with humanity from the beginning, how it was broken, and how God has been mending it since. The book of Revelation is just reiterating all of this in a very dramatic and symbolic form. Yes, there are elements that are eschatological, Okay. I'm well aware of that, but it's not primarily that. Okay? And just for those who are new, what does this word mean? The study of the end. Ology means study of, like biology. Sociology, psychology, okay, anthropology, study of, and eschaton in Greek means end. So it's the study of the end. And this end in Greek, eschaton means end like the finish. I'm watching a movie and it says, the end. What happens then? Fades to black. You get up, you dump your popcorn in the trash, and you go home. Right? That's the end. Okay? As opposed to what? Well, Greek had many words for the end. Another big word that they used was teleos. This can also mean end. But this is an end as in maturation. That would be a better translation for this. Okay? It's maturation, it's fullness, it's where it's, it's maturity. Okay? An infant is starting out when it's fully grown, when it reaches its end, it becomes an adult. That's its end, that's its where its goal is. You plant a seed, you get a flower. The flower is its end, its maturation. Okay? Different word. It doesn't mean end like we're finished with the story. See the difference? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the end. All right? So with that, why do I bring that up? Because when we get to the great harlot in Revelation 17 and 18, there's two full chapters about her. I just love it. Wait till you see my other program. I love this. It's not as, it's far more intuitive than this. I just love it. I just love it. 
Um, so we're talking about the great harlot. There's two aspects to her. Chapter 17 introduces, okay, and identifies, oops, not identified, identifies who she is. Okay. Hmm? Can I just interrupt for a minute? Do you have an outline for chapter 17? I do, but I didn't bring it. So, stay tuned. <laughs> chapter 18 describes the demise. Of the great heart. Or in other words, pronounces the judgment on the great heart. Okay? Now, to kind of give you an, a, a picture of the end of the book of Revelation, not the end of time, this is in contrast to the bride of the Lamb, which is chapter 19. You have to read the story or the identification and the demise of the great harlot in relationship to the bride. And this has been an ongoing theme in the book of Revelation. And that is what? Compare, contrast, compare, contrast. We did this all through chapters 12 and 13, did we not? What was in chapter 12? Or who should I say, who was in chapter 12? Woman and the dragon. The woman. Who was in chapter 13? The two beasts. The two beasts. The woman has offspring. Okay. Who are the offspring of the woman? Chapter 12, verse 17. Who are the offspring of the woman? What does it say? Us. We are. Man, child, and wife. No, verse 17 of chapter 12, what does it say? And the dragon of the Lord of Yes, those who have the testimony, bear the testimony of God, and bear witness to Jesus. That's the offspring of the woman. What is the offspring of the dragon? The, the two beasts. Revelation 13. So you see, even that far back, you have Revelation 12 <coughs> describing the woman clothed with the sun and her offspring, which are those who bear testimony to Jesus. And then following that, what do you have? The dragon and his offspring, which are what? The two beasts and those who worship him, right? All of chapter 13 was describing how these two beasts cause all to worship them. As opposed to what? As opposed to the woman and her offspring who worship whom? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus God, him who sits on the throne. And so, when you get into chapters 14, 15, and 16, you again see this contrast to the beasts of 13 by seeing all this worship in heaven again. Remember? So, just to give you a visual, you know what? I wonder if I can project this through my camera. Getting clever in my old age. It took me 10 years, but I think I finally got the hang of all of this. Um, let's see here.
<laughs> How's that? You see that? It's reversed, but it still gives you the idea. Okay? This is chapter 13. The worship of the bees. I know it looks backwards, but you get the idea. Okay? What is it following? Chapter 14, which is right here, which shows a vision of what? The worship of what? Of the beast. Well, no, that's 13. <laughs> 14 is? The lamb and the hundred and forty. The lamb, right? So it's back, forth, back, forth. Okay? And then what follows that is the proclamation of the gospel by the angel. Can you see that? Yes. Very yeah. good. Yes. Okay. And then? The doom. The doom of those who follow the beast. And then? The harvest. The grapes of wrath. Right? The harvest. Yeah. The judgment. And then come the judgments. So, the point I'm bringing up here is this, is to say that the, re the direction of the book of Revelation goes back and forth between those who follow God, those who follow <coughs> the devil, those who follow the woman and her seed, those who follow the devil and her seed. And where does this originate? Right, Genesis chapter 3, the fall of mankind, and specifically verse 15. Okay? Oh, which is what? Oh! Uh, <laughs> Bible gave me. Take me away. See, now I can do this. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Genesis 3. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> See? Right here. Genesis 3.15. And just for you, I can blow it up. Not too big. Uh, did I blow up so big you can't see it? No. There we go. All right. There we go. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, your seed, and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike at his heel. That is that first promise of a Savior that will come to redeem us. That's what we see interplayed in Revelation chapters 12 and 13. The seed of the woman as opposed to the seed of the serpent. You following me? So again, the major theme of the book of Revelation is what? Covenant. It's this covenant relationship that God has created since the dawn of time that he's been trying to amend or to restore, I should say. All right? So far being a book of, of, of some sort of diviner's manual into the end times, it's really a book to describe the plan of the ages. This idea if you will, of God bringing his people back to himself. Yes, it has some eschatological ramifications, but it's not its primary focus. That's a part of it, but it's not the primary part. Why do I keep saying that? Because the book has to have meaning in every generation of Christians since it was written. And if it's only or primarily about the end of the world, then what good is it? It's only going to be valuable for those people who live at the end of the world. What do we do in the meantime? Hmm? See that? 
that can't be the main reason for its being in the, in the Bible. There's got to be a bigger, better reason. And the bigger, better reason is stated in the first chapter. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And who is he? He is him who was once dead, who is now alive and lives forevermore and holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Okay, so if you miss that, you miss the purpose of this book. You know, and you get caught up with the woman, the dragon, and now the harlot, and you, and you get lost with all of the ooh and the eye ah of all of that. If anything, the ooh and the ah factor should be the one to, if you will, shock you, for lack of a better term, if I may say, offend your mind, so that you reveal the heart of where you want to go with this. What do you mean, where do you want to go with this? Do you want to continue to follow Christ? Do you want to find the revelation of Jesus? Or are you so caught up in all of this other stuff that you miss the forest for the trees? So that's why I keep beating a dead horse, if you will. But I, I, I think it's just important because this book is so sensationalized in fundamental evangelicalism. The, the kind of preaching that you hear on television and radio popularly, that it, 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 it loses its primary focus. And I think it discourages people from reading it because they're so frightened or caught off guard by all of these odd images. And you know my theory on that, right? What's my theory as to why that is? Why, why, why are, what is it? Yes, it's the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read and hear and do what it says. The only book. And does the devil want you blessed? 